Yeah, they, um, you know, in, like, when I went into residential treatment, they, they introduced us to the 12 steps, but they didn't base their curriculum on it. And um, I don't know, I think, I think 12 steps is an excellent program. I, I feel like, uh, even if you don't go to an AA meeting, or you're not, you don't know where an AA meeting is, you can still get the big book and read that thing. And that book will, will get you through. Yeah, it's a beautiful blueprint because for me, I didn't, uh, rehab wasn't an option. Um, you know, I was a primary caretaker and provider and oh. all those things. And, you know, so I just kind of had to get my, my shit together and maybe took me a little longer than I would have wanted, but Hey, I'm here. How and... did you detox if, if from alcohol? If you weren't in a rehab, just the hard way. I stopped. I just went cold Turkey and I was pretty lucky. I, a lot of people, you know, I would tell them my drinking, I was a binger guy. I wasn't necessarily an everyday guy, but it was, you know, it was, if I bought a 30 pack, how did the second pack of beer show up? You know, I was that, <laughs> that guy. Yeah. I'm amazed that I didn't, I was so lucky knock on wood to not have seizures or anything else. And, and now, you know, years later, like go to the doctor and be like, yeah, your liver and kidney functions are, are great. Your health, I was like, holy shit, <laughs> you know, yeah, like, you know, thank you for probably, looking it was probably because, uh, you lucked out probably because your age, you know, yeah. if you'd have done that 10 years later, you probably might not be looking as good as you are. <laughs> yeah, no, man, I've, I've got family members that it's, it's taken their life. So, you know, I had to admit that for sure. When my mother died, um, the day she died, I drank, what, what size of vodka is that? Fifth, a pint? Yeah, it's like fifth pint. Yeah, they call it. Fifth is a big one. Anyway, I drank a pint of vodka like that, and I stayed drunk, very drunk for three years. I'm not kidding. I would wake up, drink a bottle of vodka this big, twelve pack of beer. At night, if I woke up at one a.m. and I didn't have any booze, I'd have to get to the liquor store before two a.m. Otherwise, I wouldn't be able to get back to sleep. Mm -hmm. And one day, I was so I pickled my inside. From alcohol, I couldn't even swallow water. That's how bad my my lining was here. And I was on the floor in the fetal position. I was also my dad's caretaker, and I had to take him to the doctor that day. And I couldn't get up off the floor. And I saw his bottle of Vicodin on the dining room table. And I said, I was afraid to take it because I couldn't even swallow water. Sure. I took a couple of these Vicodin. My pains went away. I could stand up, and I took my dad to the doctor. And that was when my really, I started to uh, crave opiates, I guess. Yeah. And the opiate helped me kick alcohol. I basically quit alcohol cold turkey because uh, when I was drinking, I couldn't feel the Vicodin. Yeah, you found, you found the greater solution, right? Yeah, but, you know, it helped me get off alcohol, which I'm happy I don't drink these days. I, I really am. Yeah. No, I'm glad you don't. I'm glad I don't because, uh, you know, yeah, our man. meeting, our meeting might have been something a little different that uh, would have yeah, been. Yeah, I mean, we're, we had trouble linking up and we're both sober. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <laughs> it was the uh, holidays, you know? Yeah. Well, you, but you, so you started down this, like, when did alcohol even really come into your life or drugs in general? Was it when you underage or was it really after 21? Because people are amazed. Yeah, I had older brothers and sisters and I was hanging out with adults sure. on movie sets and stuff. So um, and my parents had a, a liquor cabinet at home. So I used to go in and, and uh, take little drinks and stuff when I was probably 12, 13. I started doing that with my high school buddies and, and, and neighborhood pal. So but just dabbling, you know, right. but it was always fun for me. I think that's one of the major elements about drugs that I got into was the excitement of it all. I like the excitement of doing something I'm not supposed to do. I like how it feels when I'm evading police. You know, I like that whole the excitement of that. Um, I think really what get, being in the movies did, it made me a, a an adrenaline junkie. Yeah. So I found other life just kind of boring. You know, when I went back to school after traveling around, it was kind of boring just going to classes and doing that kind of stuff so i think that's another thing that i definitely had to work on in therapy is not seeking such an amazing time out here and being able to turn inwards and adjust how i feel in here more than basing it on what's going on out here that mm -hmm. really helped me turn the corner 
It really helped me take control of my own mood throughout the day. When I'm not feeling good, when I'm depressed, I, I know right away. I'm like, you got to stop that. That thought process is getting you nowhere. You know, I just know that it's not a helpful thought. It's not a helpful mood. And I sit with it and I turn it around immediately. Similarly, whenever I get, I'm just giving you like my best life hacks, one after the other. Go Similarly, as soon as I get, as soon as I get the thought or an urge to get high, I know right away that that's an insane thought. I know that my, that's an in, I know that it's not sane for me to want to go and smoke meth. So I say to myself, okay, you're having an insane thought, get rid of it immediately, or it's inevitable destruction. And that's how I'm, I just do that. Because if I sit and like romanticize about what it'd be like to twirl that meth pipe around or to, you know, chase that dragon, I don't know what'll happen once those things, once that, you know, uh, process develops momentum. So I simply don't let it, yeah. don't let it happen. And that's a tough thing for a lot of, for people in general, let alone uh, us in recovery, because we have to start acknowledging that, that feeling, sitting with the feeling sometimes, you know, like I, I, I've been challenged not to avoid it with, with TV, music, podcast, whatever it is, and just really sit, recognize what it is process it a little and maybe understand why am I feeling that thus if I'm feeling it then I start it starts a thought process and you know like you said putting that block which I still have to do work on putting that block like mm, it's an insane thought I've never thought of it that way yeah I mean that's a that's a, a great hack for me because it's cut and dry I just know that's a crazy thing to think yeah. stop being crazy yeah. and that was the other uh, a hard part in re, in uh in early recovery was getting into treatment, looking at myself in the mirror, which I'm not exaggerating. I had, I had avoided mirrors for, I didn't see my surface, my reflection for a long time. And when I finally saw my reflection, the way I looked, you know, in those pictures without any teeth, I literally jumped. I literally mm -hmm. jumped. And I had to look at, at myself in the mirror and really be honest to fact, about the fact that I had become insane. Mm -hmm that I lost my mind. I could not trust my own thoughts and my own emotions. And I need, this needed to be dealt with and I need to pray to God to restore my sanity. But that's not an easy thing to do to look in the mirror and say, you're a crazy guy. You're, you're, you've lost your mind yeah. to the point where you're just, you're crazy to the point of destruction. Like, you know, the, what's the difference between jail and a sanitarium, you know, yeah. <laughs> not yeah. much. Yeah. So that was difficult, but unless you do that, you can't really fix the problem unless you address it. Yeah. So coming to terms with the fact that I've lost my mind was, uh, was difficult, but very necessary. Well, and, and with the opioids, I mean, you shared that there, just seeing it, I'm, you know, um, God, it's opioids, especially fentanyl. Man, it's so freaking scary out there now. But um, I, I don't I can't know I what to say. I really don't yeah. know what to say. When I got off the, I got off the street right as fentanyl was coming out. Mm -hmm. So I maybe had a couple encounters with it. But I mean, from what I hear now, like heroin does you can't even get heroin. It's just all fentanyl. Yeah. Um. I don't and I, I don't know what's going on. <laughs> it's it's yeah. just crazy. But I know at least a dozen people that have died. And it's just, um, you know, the and the and the, the scariest part are the kids that aren't even drug addicts at all. They're just mm -hmm. partying and they order a pill online because they want to party a weekend on a weekend, and they end up getting sick or dying off a of, off of a bad pill they got online. Horrible yeah. problem. Please yeah. do not order pills online. Please. Yeah. 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 And, you know, and don't have the, well, my dealer or any of these, these things that we hear with the work that I do. I mean, numerous, you know, moms that have come in that have lost, lost their sons and daughters this way that, you know, it was uh, exactly that. Like, I mean, an example, one kid doing very well in college, but anxiety, whatever, and goes, oh, I'll just uh, get a, get a Xanax off of, off of Snapchat. And it was not Xanax is 100% fentanyl in there. It, that's oh, it. No. You know, and yeah, he drank here and there and stuff like that. But like you said, it's not, it's not like the experimentation, you know, that, uh, 
that people think it was at one time that, you know, uh, high school, yeah, he got drunk at a party or smoked some weed or whatever. And not that those aren't killer drugs because, hey, you know, alcoholic, but by, by, by admittance, um, but it's just, it's frightening. It's, it scares me for the future for our kids. If we don't really start to focus on the sickness of our society and do the work and encourage it to happen within the home, um, that mental health has to become a greater priority. It's, it's going to, it's going to be, yeah, it's going to get worse. I think that's very important what you just said. And I, I agree with you. Yeah. I mean, you know, where, where, like you said, I mean, you know, I grew up in a home of addiction. You grew up in a home of addiction, one parent struggling with, with gambling addiction. And, you know, and I've had people on here that have suffered from that disease of it too. And, you know, these are things not to take lightheartedly. Absolutely not. Another thing, Jason, I want to mention, I, I, you know, I'm glad we're talking today because I had a couple things that I wanted to talk about. Please. Very important. It's very important if you're in like a bad way right now, right? You're on the street, you're about to get sick, you have no money, you need to boost something for your next fix. Like if you're in that spot, <laughs> literally the next thing you do, you could, I'm trying to say you can change, begin changing your situation very quickly. Mm. So it doesn't take a week to turn your life around. Literally the next thing you choose to do can turn your life around. So I don't know how to, how to articulate this, but if you literally, if you, if you go to a detox today, your entire outcome will shift dramatically. Yeah. My point is you can make very good progress with a little amount of effort but you just have to turn in that direction. Yeah. So don't feel like, don't feel overwhelmed by, by the, the, you know, don't despair. Don't despair because a one phone call, reaching out to one person, saying no to that one next bag can literally turn your entire situation around. Yeah. It's about doing the, the, the and I don't know if in the meetings, the if next, you hit them, oh, the, the next right thing. The next right thing. Yeah. That's it. That's what I was trying to say. If yeah. you get into that, start doing the next right thing, and it'll only take about three or four things, and you'll see your 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 situation will change. God, the universe will respond to you if you start to try. That's the, that's the key. Life will respond. I think it's important to explain a lot of these concepts, especially with newcomers. They're kind of lost on. Well, what the hell does that mean? You know, what is, you know, spiritual progress, not spiritual perfection me, you know, and there's, there's a lot of these concepts that can, can understandably elude people, uh, you know, I mean, especially if you haven't had a spiritual awakening of any kind, you, you don't know what the hell spiritual progress, not spiritual perfection means. I didn't. I was like, okay. My sponsor's like, oh, you'll, you, you'll figure it out soon enough. You'll know, you'll know. That's the beauty about these 12 steps. They are an instruction manual on how to have a spiritual awakening. Because yeah. Bill and Bill say, listen, we're in this position. The only thing that's going to save us is a spiritual awakening. God is the only guy that's going to pull us out of the spot we're in. And he's giving you instructions on how to do it. And that's why the last step says, after having had a spiritual awakening through going through these steps, so really, that's the point of those 12 steps is to get you to that spiritual. I mean, this is just my my interpretation, obviously. So, you know, really, I feel like I, I had that moment. And, and that's a beautiful thing. And if you do those steps, it, it will happen for you. You know, yeah. If, you, yeah. if you commit to those steps and work earnestly through that. And it, and it doesn't have to take a long time. It can happen very quickly for you, too. Yeah. You just have to put the max effort. That's the one thing I realized with my relapse is that I was doing that. I got this when I never had it. I was, I was, I was fooling myself that I was working it and really I was a dry drunk and there is a difference, you know? So. Addiction is the only thing. It's the only thing really where like, what other thing do you have success by not doing something? <laughs> right. Like as an addict, 
if I go on the first day, if I don't use, I'm already a black belt. I'm already the best I can be at this. I just have to keep doing it over time, right? I just do it tomorrow and the next day and the next day. So it's a very strange thing to have success. Like the only way I can prove that I'm successfully recovered is if time goes by. And so it's just an odd thing to, um, it's an odd thing to, to, to deal with, you know, to, 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 to win at something by doing nothing. (laughs) (laughs) I think that's why I'm good at it. (laughs) <laughs> there you have it <laughs> thanks <laughs> they just brought brighten the light on me light bulb went off uh well and we get that ultimate promise Thank right you. we are restored to sanity and then, you know what's sanity right like it's such a it's such a blurred line but you know what sanity is for me is me living in a way that where i'm joyful and I, my life is manageable yeah. and i'm you know engaged in people's lives yeah because you know, you're trying to figure out what's what's sanity. You know what I mean. But uh, if you're obviously if you're in, engaged in harmful behaviors, you, you need to take a look at things. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, and oh, that uh, that rush, that adrenaline, those things we search for, right? Hey, let me ask you this. This is a, an, an interesting one, and I've heard people of all different addictions say this. Be it the gambling addict that. Uh, or the alcoholic, the heroin addict, whatever it was, it wasn't even so much the use of the substance. Like, I don't know about you. Did you ever like on edge the anxiety? And it was before you did that substance or the, uh, the gambling addict showed up at the casino or bought the lottery tickets when they actually entered the location or met with the dealer that all of a sudden the anxiety was like, oh. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, look, I there is it's a hopeless feeling when you're a heroin addict. You're going to be dope sick every morning. Mm. You wake up, you have nothing. You're on the street, <laughs> and you need to come up with two hundred dollars before you're sick. You know, it's not a it's not a good a, a good. Uh, This is the Knocking Doors Down podcast, featuring celebrities, experts, and everyday people who have overcome adversities, including addiction, mental health, and trauma, to live purposeful lives. And that's what Knocking Doors Down is all about. This podcast contains the views and opinions of the Knocking Doors Down hosts and their guests to the show. The content here should not be taken as medical advice. The content here is for informational purposes only. And because each person is sharing their unique perspective, please consult your healthcare professional for any medical questions. Views and opinions expressed in the podcast and website are our own and do not represent that of our places of work. While we make every effort to ensure that the information we are sharing is accurate, we welcome any comments, suggestions, or correction of errors. Privacy is of the utmost importance to us. For those wishing anonymity, people, places, and scenarios mentioned in the podcast have been changed to protect confidentiality at the request of certain guests. This website or podcast should not be used in any legal capacity whatsoever, including but not limited to establishing standard of care in a legal sense or as a basis for expert witness testimony. No guarantee is given regarding the accuracy of any statements or opinions made on the podcast or website. In no way does listening, reading, emailing, or interacting on social media with our content establish a doctor-patient relationship. If you find any errors in any of the content of this podcast or blogs, please send a message through the contact page. This podcast is owned by KDD Media Company.